the fifth anniversary of what are called the 7-7 London bombings. And perhaps time to reflect on how the UK has been dealing with what many called homegrown terrorism. Just what lessons have been learned from these deadly attacks and to what extent has the fabric of a society been altered in their wake? This is Inside Story. Hello and welcome to the program. I'm Mike Hanna. It's five years since 52 people were killed and nearly 800 injured by a series of suicide bombing attacks in London. The bombers were four young Muslim men, all Britons, with apparently ordinary lives. In the wake of the attacks, the then Blair government introduced a number of new security measures, as well as what it called an outreach program aimed at understanding and integrating the country's Muslim community. Whether these measures worked or not, as Paul Brennan reports, they definitely changed the fabric of British society. The images are as vivid today as they were five years ago. Survivors emerging, bloody and dazed, from below ground. The emergency services struggling to cope with an unprecedented wave of coordinated suicide bombings. And the stories of the victims, whose lives were ended so abruptly and cruelly. 39-year-old Anat Rosenberg was on a crowded bus, talking to her partner on her mobile phone. And as she talked, um, suddenly I heard screams, ghastly screams in the background. Nothing from Anat, no explosion. And after a few seconds, the line went dead. There had been an explosion. Anat had been killed instantly. Five years on, Mr. Falding still feels an acute sense of loss, but no hatred. If I had to have express any, any, any animosity, it would be towards those people who radicalized the bombers, who fed them such a distorted view of Islam. As well as the four suicide bombers, 52 people were killed. 7-7, as it became known, changed Britain forever. An anti-Muslim backlash was contained and minimized through swift political intervention. And in the five years since, Muslim beliefs and concerns have moved from the political sidelines to the mainstream. Not because of terrorists, this is because of the resolve of the people of this country to define each tragedy in a positive way that it helps us to move, not only move on, but also to be vigilant and cautious, and also to remedy those issues that created it at the first place. On July 7th last year, this simple memorial to the victims was inaugurated. 52 steel pillars, one for each of the victims, and a plaque bearing all their names. Thousands of people pass this spot every day, Few give it a second glance. It's just another one of London's many public monuments. But each of these 52 pillars represents a cherished family member ripped away from their loved ones by extremist hatred. And the steel that each is made of represents the strength required to overcome that hatred. Paul Brennan, Al Jazeera, London. Joining us now from London are our guests. Firstly, Huraya Ahmed. She's a researcher at the Center for Social Cohesion, also joining us, Tobias Fekin. He's head of Homeland Security Capabilities at the Royal United Services Institute for Defense and Security Studies. And finally, Azam Tamimi. He's a director of the Institute of Islamic Thought. Welcome to you all. Let's begin with Tobias Fekin. How successful do you think the government has been in countering terror acts over the past five years? Uh, depends exactly how you, you look at quantifying success. I mean, in terms of, um, you know, inhibiting would-be terrorists to actually carry out successful attacks, yeah, absolutely. You know, we've been very, very successful in the UK at countering uh, that threat. We haven't had any successful uh, attack since 2005, uh, the events of 2005. So in that sense, yes, we've been very, very successful. Um, I guess your question is also hinting at how successful have we been, if you like, in, in undermining um, violent extremist thought uh, within the UK and countering the threat from within the UK. And that, that's far more difficult to actually quantify and say how successful or otherwise we've actually been. 
Well, let me put that to Azam Tamimi. Um, how successful on that particular level do you think attempts have been to lower the level of possible threat among discontented communities? Well, I'm delighted that uh, the atrocities have not been repeated. Uh, no uh, sane person uh, living in Britain, whether Muslim or uh, non-Muslim, would want to see these atrocities because we are all uh, potential victims uh, when these things happen. Uh, however, I think uh, the uh, problem is that uh, the government uh, adopted uh, measures which, in my opinion, uh, will not uh, resolve uh, the issue forever and will not eradicate the potential for uh, a resumption uh, of uh, such uh, atrocious uh, uh, acts in the future. Well, well, explain further why you believe that. You see, you need uh, three things in order to eradicate extremism and uh, uh, eliminate uh, the possibility of uh, 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 of uh, violence. First, policing, and this is where all the effort has been uh, uh, concentrated. Uh, second, uh, community relations, uh, getting the community to help uh, in uh, controlling, curtailing, uh, and undermining uh, any such uh, uh, trends. And what the government has done is uh, mechanically intervene uh, uh, in the Muslim community, uh, resulting in uh, uh, or uh, ca causing uh, a backlash. Uh, Muslims are very unhappy about uh, what the government has been doing uh, since uh, then. Uh, and thirdly, there is uh, also the necessity of uh, review of policy. The reason these young men were uh, radicalized and were recruited by Al-Qaeda is that they had grievances which are shared by many others in this country, Muslims and non-Muslims alike. Uh, and despite having been proven wrong in going to war in Iraq and earlier in Afghanistan, uh, the government has done nothing uh, about uh, reviewing policy uh, or even admitting that uh, it has been wrong. Well, Huria Ahmed, um, your view about those statements, in particular the government, and I quote, mechanically interfering in the Muslim com uh, community in the wake of the attacks. Well, firstly, I'd like to point out that though there have been a number of terrorist plots that the government and the security services have been successful in stopping and thwarting, they have been very lucky in other circumstances. Straight after 7-7, in that very same month, in the very same year, we had a group of young men who had also attempted to detonate bombs in the London underground. However, their bombs did, luckily, their bombs did not detonate. It's the same case with the Glasgow airport bombings. Luckily, no one died in that suicide attack. Same case with some lone wolf individuals that we've had in the UK who attempted to detonate bombs, but it didn't work. So I think they have has been to a certain extent the government being successful but at the same time they were just extremely lucky. I think in terms of interfering as as um, Tamimi has said um, within the Muslim community I think it's dangerous for the government to assume that the threat mainly comes from the Muslim community. Yes Al-Qaeda does represent the biggest threat and poses the biggest threat to the UK's national security but the government has unfortunately painted the same brush of extremism towards Muslim towards Muslim community in the UK. The Center for Social Cohesion has actually just released a report showing, um, looking at 124 individuals who've been convicted of Islamism-related offenses since 99 to 2009. And what we have shown is that the threat is actually, um, we, the threat is actually quite targeted in the sense that the majority of individuals who were convicted were young men, mostly came from London, um, mainly came from the South Asian community, um, and often had links to Pakistan. So when you're looking at countering the terrorism threat, it's important to target your, ter um, your, your strategies to those areas, as opposed to, for example, giving money to, to all community organizations or any community organizations hoping that they'll combat radicalization or extremism within Muslim communities in the UK. Well, you mentioned there the paper that the uh, Center for Social Cohesion has produced. And if I could just quote some of the other facts that you present in that particular paper,
paper. And that is uh, details such as the fact that 31% um, of those studies actually had a higher education. 31% uh, attempt attended training camps abroad. 32% had links, links to prescribed organizations. Now, what I'd like to ask you, Tobias Fikin, is why is it left to a private organization to produce statistics such as this, which are, would appear on the face of it to be invaluable in terms of countering any potential threat? Um, that's probably best to ask the government that question, and I certainly don't represent them. I, I would suggest that in terms of, you know, think tanks like my own and also the Centre for Social Cohesion, you know, that's our job to assess evidence that we can find to try and enlighten government policy in, in any way that we can. And, and you know, if, if, if the government were conducting a study like that themselves, it would immediately be invalid in many respects and could be perceived as such from the public. But the fact that an independent body has come out and, you know, conducted this research, a valuable piece of research, um, you know, is highly significant in itself. As I'm Tamimi, um, I'd like to pick up on the uh, point that was made uh, just a little bit earlier about part of the government's measures, or a very large part of them, have been targeting a specific section of the British uh, society, and that is the Muslim community. Um, what is your views on the fact that a sector of the society is singled out rather than the behavior of the society as a whole? Well, uh, because uh, the atrocities were committed by uh, Muslim individuals and because uh, in their justification of their uh, acts, uh, they relied on uh, uh, Islam and uh, quoted is, is, uh, verses from the Quran and because they referred to Islamic causes, uh, the general impression is that uh, this is uh, a Muslim uh, problem. Uh, although in, uh, if, if, in reality and if the government wants to deal with uh, this problem uh, uh, correctly, it should be seen as a political problem rather than a religious problem. Uh, and uh, f uh, targeting or giving the impression that the Muslim community is being targeted uh, may appease certain segments of society like the uh, extreme right or la like the Zionist lobby in this country, uh, but it will definitely uh, spoil uh, uh, relations between the Muslims uh, and the government on the one hand and between or among the various uh, components of uh, British society, that is the Muslims and the non-Muslims. Well, certainly one remembers historically that in the IRA bombing campaigns of the 80s and the 90s, uh, certainly this type of program was not followed. No singling out of an Irish community, for example, for special attention. Tobias Fekin, why do you think there is a specified direction of the government attempts um, over the past five years to prevent further such attacks. Um, I think if you'll actually look at some of the documentation that the government, you know, provide us now in terms of their prevent program, actually, you know, they're quite careful to define that they don't specifically target the Muslim population of the UK. You know, within violent extremism, they include far right groups. Um, you know, a, a extremist animal rights groups who are willing to use violence in that sense. So I think it's a lesson that's been learned from government's perspective that, you know, by, certainly in terms of the language that they use in both in public and also kind of documentation that they use, they need to make sure that, you know, they're, they're, they're not seen to be targeting one particular part of society. Um, I mean, let, let, let's not forget, you know, this is about um, Al-Qaeda-inspired terrorism that, that really, you know, a lot of the, 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 the kind of push from government came to counter that particular threat. And that is an ideological, uh, I, I, you know, Al-Qaeda is an ideology as far as I'm concerned. And, and really what government's concerned with is countering that ideology and that threat, if you like. They're not, um, you know, as far as I'm concerned, particularly targeting the entire Muslim population. It's about countering the Al-Qaeda ideological threat. And in terms of what they've been doing around the PREVENT program, um, I think, you know, there's a lot of good work that's gone on there. Conversely, some not so good work which actually you know has included people who perhaps um, shouldn't be representing communities because they, they clearly don't but again you know lessons have to be learnt from that experience the prevent program I think could do with you know a, a, an overhaul in terms of how it's um, how it's presented how it's um, how it's conceived um, and also how it's delivered and how the messages from the center about you know what prevent really stands for how those messages are actually you know put out to uh, both those people who have to implement the programs and also you know those who are affected by them. Well, uh, Huria Ahmed, um, critics of that prevent program that we've heard mention of there contend that 
It is a program aimed at ideas rather than at uh, against um, actions. Uh, what's your view? I think pre the Prevent Agenda has a lot of positives and negatives. Yes, it is a program aimed at ideas, which makes it even more difficult to try and to try and counter those ideas if you don't really know how to def define those ideas in the first place. I mean. <laughs> Excuse me, but Tobias said that you know pr the government's agenda talks about violent extremism in general. I think the government is trying to be too politically correct by not actually defining the threat, where it comes from, or what the threat actually is. Yes, we have a problem with white supremacism, we have a problem with animal rights extremism, but we also have a problem with Islamist terrorism. So let's define it. Let's talk about this, the, this problem. And I think that's the, that's the problem. The problem is that a lot of Muslim communities in the UK feel that they are targeted by the government. Um, on, uh, whether rationally or unrationally so, um, and the government really needs to decide how they want to give money to organizations. At the moment, they're just giving money to any organizations. They're funding sports activities and or, or, or think tanks trying to um, claiming to counter radicalization. But we actually haven't seen the results of how the money being spent, which is over a hundred million pounds a year, is actually countering radicalization. What are the positive effects of it? Have, we can't really see that because every year so far, even today, um, the government talks about trying to thwart uh, cells that are planning attacks in the UK. Well, let's just pause here. And um, government officials said a number of families requested that there be no formal event marking the anniversary. But there have been complaints from others at the lack of an official commemoration. Yet during the weekly question time in Parliament, Prime Minister David Cameron marked the day in a brief statement. Our hearts should go out to the families and friends of those who died. They will never be forgotten. And our thoughts are also with those who were injured physically and mentally by the dreadful events of that day. It was a dreadful day, but it is also a day that will remain, I believe, a symbol of the enduring bravery of the British people. Well, we have the issue as well of a proper inquiry into those events five years ago. Azam Tamimi, um, the government, the present government, well, the Prime Minister, David Cameron, um, his partner in the coalition, Nick Clegg, were in complete agreement two years ago that a full inquiry should be held into these attacks. They appear to be shifting ground now. How important do you think it is that a full inquiry into the events be held and uh, be publicly held? Well, I think the inquiry should be part of a more comprehensive inquiry as to why this country went to war in Iraq in the first place. Because that's what uh, led to this uh, situation. And I, I remember when I and many of my colleagues uh, marched the streets of London against uh, the war in Iraq. And we did warn the government and we said to the government uh, that uh, by doing this, you're going only to provide Al Qaeda and its uh, like organizations with a pretext uh, to continue their uh, acts and to come and attack us uh, here in, in the UK. And at the time, uh, I remember some, some people uh, ridiculed uh, such uh, warnings that came from the anti-war uh, camp. Uh, so uh, the inquiry should be a, a more comprehensive one. Uh, if you make the wrong decisions, and if you squander the resources of the country and look at, at the mess that this country is uh, at the moment because of the shortage of funds and then now they want to impose uh, a program of austerity on, uh, on the public, uh, uh, is this related to Iraq? Is this because of Afghanistan? And th th this has to be part of the inquiry. And part of the inquiry is what this uh, in, uh, intervention in Iraq led to in terms of uh, radicalizing young uh, men who were unhappy about uh, government policy. Well, Tobias uh, Fikin, the Blair government went out of its way uh, to stress its view that there was no linkage whatsoever between foreign policy and these bombings. Was this wrong, do you believe? Um, I think, you know, at the time, I think that statement was entirely misguided, and I, I don't think you hear you would hear the same kind of comment coming from a senior government official. I just like to say that there, there is an Iraq inquiry ongoing right now, whatever people might think of it in terms of the truths that, that come out of that. 
there is a Chilcot inquiry ongoing right now into you know the Iraq war and the reasons for actually entering Iraq. Um, in terms of uh, you know the, the 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 need for an inquiry into 77, I think um, if we think about you know the victims of 77, and I mean, you know by that I also mean their families. You know for them it's I think it's quite important to have closure on 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 the subject, and only after that happens then perhaps they can begin to to you know, not, not, not forgetting, obviously, but, but perhaps have some kind of closure on that particular event itself. Um, in terms of, you know, the, the, the links between um, violent extremism and foreign policy choices that are made abroad, um, you know, I think from a lot of studies that have been made, there are linkages to foreign policy decisions that are made and, and radicalizing narratives uh, for, for the individuals, um, that, that there is a strong association, but it's not the only path to radicalization. It's one of, uh, you know, it's one of many routes to, to individuals becoming radicalized. Okay, so yes, it is part of, um, you know, the narrative that is used for radicalization, but it's not the only one. So I think it would be misguided to say that it was the only one, uh, that, that, you know, the only narrative that's used by individuals looking to radicalize others. Huria Ahmed, your view about the linkage between terrorism and foreign policy? Well, I'd like to first just say 9-11 didn't happen because of Iraq or Afghanistan. I think foreign policy is definitely, I agree with Tobias, foreign policy is used as a propaganda tool by ideologues who are looking to radicalize vulnerable young youth, uh, young people. Um, but whether, whether the extent to which foreign policy, um, sorry, terrorism is a result of foreign policy, uh, it's not necessarily correct to say it's definitive. There are a number of factors that can influence one's path to radicalization and to commit violence. Foreign policy may be one of the grievances, but I don't think any government should be held hostage to, to people who want to commit violent acts because they may disagree with their, with their foreign policy. I mean, you have to remember that when it comes to Islamist radicalization, ideologues like to prey on this concept that the West is constantly at war with Islam and Muslims and has been since the fall of the Ottoman Empire. So again, as I, I just want to end by saying that 9-11 didn't happen because of Iraq or Afghanistan. Uh, Tobias Fikin, the whole question of that inquiry into events. Do you think that this government generally, the new government, is going to be handling the threat of terror acts any differently from the previous one? Um, in some respects, I think they have no choice. I mean, this, uh, if you look at kind of policy statements that were made before they came into government, there was certainly going to be a reassessment of kind of certain areas of counter-terrorist legislation. And to be fair, we're beginning to see elements of that occurring. Um, there, was, there were certainly murmurings that they were going to be reassessing the prevent programs and exactly how, how that would be interpreted uh, through this new government. Um, we, we, we're seeing as well that, that, that there, there is are going to be, um, we'll see what under what guise that, that, that really occurs, but a, a discussion about civil liberties and, and how many of those are being given up um, because of, you know, the, the, the you know, fighting terrorism, if you like. Um, so we're seeing some of those messages. I mean, we saw also from Cameron the fact that he's he's willing to to open up the the, the question of you know the MI5's um, involvement or otherwise in in torture uh, during the the so-called war on terrorism. Um, so there there are some signs that that this government want to kind of draw, uh, kind of reassess and then draw a line under it and move on, if you like. Um, as to how effectively they, how effectively they do that um, is another matter altogether. Well, there's a final word, and my thanks to our guests, Azam Tamimi, Huria Ahmed, and Tobias Fikin. Thank you so much for joining us here on this edition of Inside Story. We welcome your comments and suggestions. Please email them to us at insidestory at aljazeera.net. I'm Mike Hanna. Goodbye for now.